right? It's not just physical, it's also in the realm of your mind. For which, verse 6, things say, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. And this is why we are all headed, we are all headed for hell, we are in spiritual death because of the fall. We are born with these natural affections to do the things of the flesh. In the which ye also walked some time. Each and every one of us has been there. We've been there, we've done that, we've committed one of a multitude of sins, if not various of it. Just because you may not have been a murderer doesn't mean you've never committed theft or told a lie or something else that defies God's law. We've all broken that law, we're all equally guilty of death. Right, verse 7, in the which we have also walked some time when we lived in them, before we were saved. This is who we are. We are just the, we are just the same as the criminals hanging on the cross next to Jesus Christ. The same. We are the same as Barabbas. We right? are the same as Saul, who persecuted Christians. We are the same. We are the same. But now, verse 8, but now, ye also put off all these things. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. You are now saved. You are given a new nature. A new man lives in you. You are to put off. Put off. It's a verb. Verb means it takes action. It doesn't happen automatically. Verse 10. You have to put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. We are created after the image of God. He's given us a divine nature. Verse 11. Where there is neither Jew nor Greek, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarians, it is born of Greek, but Christ is all and in all. This is talking about being salvation, right? In salvation. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. Once you are saved, you become God's elect. You become a choice person in the eyes of God. You are the apple of His eye. Alright? Holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. Any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Christ tells you, you know, can you think of the worst sin you've committed in your life? Your deepest, darkest secret. One thing that you'll never want to discuss openly with anyone, even privately with another person, is something you struggle with. Think of that one sin. Christ forgave you for that. Who are we to deny forgiveness to someone else who has done something less than that to us? Right? That's what the Bible is saying. If Christ has met you at your worst, who are we to deny this grace to other people when we have freely received of it? Verse 14, And above all these things put on charity, which is love, agape, the love of God, which is the bond of perfectness. What holds the church together? Love. Not your love or my love for each other. No, we are not lovable. There's nothing about me, or at least I think, that's very lovable. There's nothing about you that's very lovable. We are lovable because of who is in us, because of Christ. Who holds the church together? It's not your effort and mine to work together, to be fellowshipping together, to say, hey, brethren, you know, let's do this, let's do that. No, it's Christ. Agape love of God that He gives to you and to me and that flows out from us, that connects us and holds the church together. It's Christ that holds the church together. It's not your efforts or mine. And we will do best if we yield to that love. Like I mentioned last week, we talked about, you know, we are constrained by the love of God, right? It pushes us in a direction. And if we will do well, do not resist it. Because when we resist it, that's when we are resisting the bonds of perfectness. We become resistant to what the work of Christ that is trying to do in building His church. We should go with the flow. We should be constrained by the love of God to love your brother even though we are not lovable. This person, I am. Always talk about it. This person, I am not regular in church. We are always regular in church. No, we must be the image of Christ. We must love them as Christ loved them. Right? Same. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Why? Why the peace of God? Because it's hard to love people who are unlovable, isn't it? I ask you, when, who do you not like the most in church today? Go and love the person. Yeah. Can I love other people first? I will slowly, la, slowly talk to them, invite them to lunch, get to know each other better. La. I mean, oh, straight up, you ask me to go and give them a hug, can So difficult. But you have the peace of God. That's why it says, and let the peace of God rule in your heart. You do it, despite it being difficult, 
and you will be you will find peace in doing it because this is what God desires to do, which also we are called in one body in your church. Let there be no schism and be ye thankful. Be ye thankful. Now, so that's the verses, alright? Introduction. <laughs> when we put on something, so putting on charity, right? The title, when we put on something, it means that that something is not something that we are born with. The fact that you have to put it on, it's like we talk about your skin, right? You have to put on your skin, you don't grow it from yourself. You don't have to put it on. But you can't grow your clothes. Therefore, you have to put your clothes on. And you can take your clothes off. You can't take your skin off because it's part of who you are. Your skin. You take your skin off, you die. Probably, you know, a slow death, but you still die. You can't survive. So, the righteousness of the righteousness of God is like that. We cannot grow it. We don't have it in us to grow. It has to be given. It has to come from somewhere other than ourselves. And that is what God has done. In salvation, He has given us His righteousness. He has made us the righteousness of Christ. Because we are in Him, we receive Him at salvation. He was made sin for to be sin for us, that we may be made the righteousness of Christ, of God in Him. We may be made the righteousness of God in Him. So now, having been made the righteousness of God, we are told that being in the righteousness of God, we must now put on the charity of God as well. <clears throat> Something that we do not naturally have within ourselves. We don't have that agape also in the Greek, right? We've covered this before. The Greek has four different words for the word love. Phileo, eros, storge, and agape. The three, storge, uh, eros, and... What's that word? Anyway, the other three are three things that the human can naturally do. It's like a bond of fellow love to your fellow man, love for your for your, uh, your, your sexual partner, love for your, your family, in that sense, right? Different kinds of love, brotherly love. But those loves are not the highest level that we can attain, which is the agape love. And we do not naturally possess this agape love. It is to be given to us. We experience it when God pours His love into us at salvation. When we receive His love, and then only then can we become vessels of it to other people because we can experience it. Oh, this is what it is like to love this way. I've never loved this way before. I could never have thought to have loved this way before. A sacrificial kind of love, despite being used and abused, spat on, slapped, you know, and still die for me. Wow, sacrifice to the death. There's no greater love. Greater love has no man than to give his life for his friends. And that's what Christ did for us. And I realized, wow, what can I not do for someone else if I'm really told to die for him? Right? That's the ultimate Christ really of this, the, this friendship, this love. If I can die for someone, what is giving them bread? Right? Well, what is giving them money? What is giving them clothes or a shelter to live under or food? Right? It's a small thing compared to having to die for someone. Right? <coughs> so, Again, it is something we do not naturally possess. We don't naturally possess it, we are not born with it, we cannot grow it from within ourselves. This love has to be acquired from somewhere and we have to put it on. Christ died to pay for these gifts that He freely gives to us. Christ and God is able to pour out His love to us, the sinner, because we are justified in the blood of Christ. Because Christ has paid for the sin debt in the legal court of God, we are justified and we can freely receive gifts now. Where once we were convicted felons, we are now free and innocent men. Alright, because of Christ. And we have the eligible, we are now eligible to receive of the blessings and gifts. <clears throat> and as we have covered last week, the more love we receive from the Lord, the more we are able to give in terms of God's agape love. But we must first be partakers of it. We have been given it by the Lord Himself to possess it in our lives. And then we are able to give it out to others. You know why we find it difficult to love other people, even Christians, truly born again Christians sometimes? Why do we find it difficult to love other people and even the brethren in church? Why? Because we are trying to love them from our own ability. We are not being the vessels of Christ that we ought to be. We are not loving them with the love that God has given to us. We are loving them with our own effort. 
That's why. And we get tired. You know why we get tired? Because we're not drawing from the source that never runs to run. We are drawing from our own source. Remember last week, the two came up here, they had their own containers, right? And they are trying to scoop and give up to everyone. You're trying to scoop and scoop and scoop. Your container will run up. But you need to come and replenish it from the never-ending supply of God. And if you're not doing that, you're not going to be able to give out more to people. You understand? That's why you get tired. That's why you get fatigued. That's why you get burned out. I uh, care for this person. I talk to you so many times, really, it's still like that. Forget it. Uh. Why? Because you're trying it on your own effort. You're not drawing from the well of God that is eternal, that is free and free-flowing. That's a problem with many Christians today. Even though we know that there's such a place that exists, that such a thing exists, that never any word of God. So point number one this morning, <clears throat> first and foremost, we need to set our affection. Set our affection. What does set your affection mean? Setting your affection means to exercise the mind towards something, someone, to entertain a sentiment or opinion, to be mentally disposed earnestly in a particular direction. To passionately interest oneself in something. That is to set your affection. That is what it means to set your affections. Be very interested in something. To set our affection on something means to look earnestly towards something or someone with great interest. Many Christians today do not properly understand the weight of the gift that was given to them. And one of the reasons for this is ignorance. Ignorance. <clears throat> if you are living a life that is so so for the Lord, it's because of ignorance. Turn to Luke chapter 7, verse 36 to 47. Turn there, read, turn there because it's quite a passage to read. And we will see why. Why are some Christians so ignorant? Why are some Christians living ignorantly? Rather, if I might put it that way. I won't say that they are ignorant, but they are living ignorantly. It's because they do not fully understand the weight of salvation. They don't understand the weight of salvation. They take salvation by me. Salvation is something that I say on a Sunday after church. Somebody said, you believe in Jesus? I say, yes, I believe in Jesus. I actually do believe in Jesus. I pray I receive him as my saviour and that's that I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. Yay, praise the Lord. I'm assuming this person is truly saved. Okay? But they do not fully understand and say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me and cleanse me of my sin. What came to mind wasn't their sin. It was a generic idea that yes, I acknowledge I'm a sinner. But if you actually think of the worst things, something that your own wife and children will not even forgive you for, can you imagine something like that? The Lord forgive you for that. He loves you for that. And take you out of that. Free you from that. Uh, that's only when you realize, oh, wow, okay, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. My own father, mother cannot forgive me for this, but God can forgive me for this. That kind of sin, you know? All of us have something like that. Think about it, right? Yeah. Think about your life. The combination of all those sins, even. Not just one particular thing, but the combination of everything. God can forgive us for that. And you realize that, you realize the gravity of the salvation. Okay, anyway, come with me to Luke chapter 7, verse 36 to 47. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought up an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now, this woman wasn't weeping because she was sad, okay? She, she wasn't crying because she was sad. We'll see later on, verse 39. Now, when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, the Pharisee, you know, he's there in the Pharisee's house, he's having lunch with Jesus, having a meal with Jesus. This woman comes in and says, crying, and then like suddenly just pour precious oil on Jesus' feet, wipe his feet, crying at his feet, you know, and she's like a mess in the Pharisee's house. Like, what's going on, man? And having lunch, she was right? Like, Come on, have to be respect, right? I'm a Pharisee, you know, and uh, this is Jesus, you know, like, he's a prophet of God and all that. Like, why are you, like, you know, doing this year? That's the appropriate time and place for this, so and so forth. All right? <clears throat> Verse 39, now, when the Pharisee which had bidden Jesus saw him, he spake within himself. He thought, this is what he thought. 
This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him. For she is a sinner. If this is Jesus, whom he says is the Son of God, he would know this woman is unclean. Why does he let her touch him like that? You know, I would never allow this. How can it be? And then verse 40, and Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, Jesus read his heart. Jesus knew his heart. He says, he was saying this in himself, right? But Jesus heard it. Jesus knew it. And Jesus said, Simon, I have someone to say unto you. And he said, Master, stay on. He didn't know that Jesus caught on to what he was thinking. Verse 41, there was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. So one owed 50, one owed 500. <clears throat> and when he had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them. Means he gave them, he sincerely forgave everything. Right? Say, never mind, both of you don't need to pay me anything at all. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Verse 43, Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he gave forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into your house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of the head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same lover little. Was Simon any less of a sinner than this woman? I don't think so. I'm sure he had just as much sins as her. He was as guilty of the law as she was. Okay? As far as the law of God is concerned. Simon, a Pharisee who thought he was clean, was as filthy as this woman was in terms of sin. <coughs> Why then were their behaviors so different in the presence of Jesus Christ, the Son of God? Why did Simon behave so like, uprightly, whereas the woman cried and you know, made a mess of herself in the feet of Jesus? Because the difference is not Jesus. The difference is not because she was a sinner and he is holy, he is not holy. They were the same. Why were their reactions to sin and who Jesus was so different? The answer is because of the difference in their self-awareness of their own sin. The difference is the self-awareness of their own sin. One was more ignorant of his sin than the other. The woman was not deluded about herself. She knew where she came from. She knew she was unclean. She knew that she had done many bad things in her life. And there was this Jesus who could forgive sin and allow her into heaven. As far as she was concerned, she's condemned to hell and I am, I am from home going to hell. But because this Jesus is here to save me, he is so precious to her. She took her most precious oil and went to him and cried. That's why I say when she was crying, it wasn't because she was sad. She was crying because she was convicted in her heart of who she is. She was convicted in the heart of who Jesus is. She was convicted that Jesus loved her. And she felt so bad about being loved by this man whom she didn't re deserve to receive anything from because of who she is. And that's why she was crying. That's why she was crying. She knew she didn't deserve it. And she couldn't, she couldn't, it was out of her mind, this love that was being shown by Jesus to her. And that's why she was crying. She broke down. She couldn't deal with herself. But the Pharisee, his pride blinded him. His pride blinded him. He sat there, he judged the woman, judged Jesus, why you let her touch you. And he didn't even see that he was just as bad as she was. And are we like that today? As Christians, oh, I go to church, oh, I read my Bible, oh, I pray everything, oh, I go check things, so I'm better than someone else. No. Shouldn't be that. We are just as guilty as the Pharisee is then in that case. Right. The woman was under no delusion about her sinfulness and need of cleansing which she could not bring about by herself but by the power of God alone. While the Pharisee from his pride was blinded in his heart from his true state. That was the difference. That was just the one difference between Jesus was precious to the woman simply because he was everything that she was not. He was everything she needed that she could not obtain on her own. 
Simon the Pharisee, on the other hand, like many other scribes and Pharisees, thought he kept the law pretty well, followed the religious rituals, and felt he probably was on the path to heaven. What can we learn from this? Are you a Simon, the self-righteous expert in God's law? Or are you an unnamed sinful woman from the streets who love Jesus much? What kind of Christian are we here? God says in Colossians 3, verse 2 to 3, which is from our text this morning, Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for you are dead. The Pharisee Simon is dead. The woman is dead. Everyone around Jesus was dead. It doesn't matter who you are, the king or the pauper, you're dead in sin. You all needed, they all needed Jesus Christ. We all needed Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if you're the president of Singapore or you are uh, uh, someone living on social welfare in Singapore. Whoever it is, Chinese, Indian, Malay, Tamil, whatever, it doesn't matter. We all are dead. And if you are saved, your life is hid with Christ in God. Do you know that you are dead? The sinful woman knew she was dead. She knew with all her sins very clearly where she had come from. And that is your and that your life is not your own, but hid with Christ in God. The only reason that you have any hope is because of Christ. Simon, for all the expertise in the law he possessed as a Pharisee, he could not see this. He could not see this. His pride had blinded him, and for this, Simon did not understand the gravity of what it meant to be in the presence of the Son of God, a Pharisee. Likewise, we Christians today, we are the ones who are supposed to have the knowledge and wisdom of the Bible and possess God in our hands and in our lives. Many times, we live worsely, worse lives than those who are outside. We, we are more judgmental than people who are outside. We are less loving than people who are outside. And that's a very sad thing, very contradictory, very ironic. But that's the fact, that's the reality of certain Christian, Christian lives today. So point number one, first and foremost as Christians, before you want to do all the good deeds, before you want to go and preach the laws and preach to the same, first and foremost, you in your personal life need to set your affection on things above. If you cannot do that right, then you cannot progress anywhere. We must first set our affection on the things above. Point number two, put off. Put off. When we set our affection on something, that means to turn away from something else. If I set affection on my wife, I say, okay, I'm going to marry this girl, Mary Ann, right? Means I must put away my affection from any other woman in my life. I mean, in the sense of a spouse, right? in the sense of a romantic partner. I have to put away, I have to turn away from them. I cannot say I love you and then I love the rest at the same time. It's not going to happen, right? It's not going to happen. Okay? When we say we set our affection on something, that means to turn away from other things. To put on the garment of Christ, we ought to first take off the old man. Now, if you walk into Hermes or some brand, big brand, right? You buy a brand new suit for a wedding. Right? Imagine that. Huh? Let's say there was once in the evening I took the brown line down to Orchard and I walked from Orchard to City Hall to do some cardio. So I was a bit sweaty, like, you know, but on the way I saw a lot of these branded clothes stores and stuff. If you have just gone for a job and you're dirty, you're sweaty, you're smelly, would you walk into the store, buy a new suit and put on the suit straight away? Or will you go home and bathe first? Go home and bathe first, right? Same thing here. When we put on Christ, we must first take off the, the old man. We must crucify the old man first. You understand? We, we, I mean, of course, this is not salvation. Right? You, you, you are given the new nature, whether you are clean or not. The point is, we cannot live with the dirt in our lives and continue to want to be the vessel of Christ and be the vessel of God's love to other people. It will get mixed up. And people will, will get mixed signals from us. People will see that, hey, you look very nice, but you smell very bad. You know, things like that. When we put on Christ, we must put off the garment of the old man. If we simply wear it over the flesh, over the worldliness that is still in us, it means the rock is still festering within. The rock is still festering within. We will be like a person swearing with vulgar words, getting aggressive and violent, committing all sorts of crime and sin, all the while wearing an expensive suit or glamorous dress. And that's why we are to first remove the old man. In turning away from the flesh, the world of pride, we put them off. That is to say, we take them off. 
pour them out, empty ourselves of them, cut ties with, have a clean break, linger no longer in. Alright, we have to like literally mortify them. The Bible uses the word mortify to kill, to kill the members, right? The old, the old men. Our insides ought to match the garments that Christ has given us. Of course, these garments are not physical and we speak of spiritual things. These garments are covering for the soul that one day will dwell in a glorious body, but not yet. God is preparing us for the glorified body which He has promised to us, and right now, He is working in us, having given us garments for our souls, changing us to who we ought to be in Christ. And we must cooperate in the work of the Holy Spirit in us by not resisting Him. This is not talking about salvation, right? This is talking from the basis of salvation. We are talking about conforming to the image of God, to the image of Christ, His Son. We need to conform. We need to be more and more like Christ, not more and more like our old selves. Okay? We must be less and less like our old selves and more and more like Christ. We cannot become more and more like Christ while being the same old selves that we, are, we used to be. We cannot be more like Christ while being, the, being more of our same old selves also. They are in contradiction. It doesn't happen. It cannot be. It cannot be. Okay? You either love Christ more or you love your old self more. We cannot serve God and man. And we must cooperate with the work of the Holy Spirit in us by not resisting Him. <clears throat> Put off, the Bible says, the old man with the former deeds. Mortify the body, kill the flesh and its desires. The Bible says, for oh, you are dead. Everything that we do in the old man is of death. And your life is hid with Christ and God. To have true life in the sense of living a life that is fulfilling and purposeful in the, to the glory of God, we have to do it in Christ and through Christ. So, point number two, put off. And then point number three, put on. Why do I put this in this sequence? Because the Bible put it in this sequence. You see, it says in verse, Colossians chapter 3, verse uh, uh, 5, Mortify therefore your members, put off, and then in verse, uh, verse 8 also, put off all these, and then in verse 10, it says, put on the new man. Alright, so that's the sequence the Bible gave, and I'm using that sequence. Point 2, put off, point 3, put on. Above all these, Put on charity, which is Christ. Charity is agape or love. Agape or love is Christ. They are synonymous, one and the same. Christ is love. Love exists because of Christ. Okay. When we say when we say God is love, it's not saying that God comes under the umbrella of love. No. The love, love as the purest form of love exists because God. So when we say God is love, we don't say there is love and then God is in love. No. There is God and then love comes out from God. Okay? You must understand that. Huh? Without God, there will be no love. No. Put on the garment of Christ. The love of God that has been given to us should be a permanent fixture in our lives and should be how others identify us with. A garment that we wear always. When I was in the polyclinic, Right. Uh, polytechnic when I was in poly, uh, that was the time of my back sliding and I would wear this black hoodie to, ch- to, to school every day. I just like black like, black things and I wear the black, it's like a hoodie. Like. And I didn't stay in school long, three months I did school. And then my friend, the one friend that I made in school, I met that I met him up after that, he says, hey, you know what you were called in class last time? You were called the guy who wear the black hoodie. Because not everyone knows my name because I didn't really talk to my classmates. Three months in school, I quit school really, so yeah. But I was known as a guy to wear the black hoodie. Now, that's not the point. The point here is, as Christians, how are you recognized by the people around you? How are you recognized as the people around you? Are you recognized first and foremost? Oh, he's, oh yeah, this guy is a Christian. He is always talking about God. He's in you know, church on Sunday. I know this guy, he loves his God a lot, whatever it is. Are we identified first and foremost? by the robes of Christ that we put on daily? Or are we known better for something else first? Something for us to think about. If our relatives, our friends, our colleagues, 
people around us, strangers, remember us as oh that person who always tell me my religion one is wrong one. Or that guy who always like to debate about whether Buddhism or Christianity is correct. Then we are probably remembered for the wrong thing. We are remembered for the wrong thing. We have not represented Christ very well in the case. We probably have not put on charity like the Lord has told us to. Maybe we have put it on wrongly, maybe upside down, I don't know. But if the people around us look at us and still see us, then we have not properly put on Christ. Let me say that again. If the people around us look at us, Christians, and still see us, then we have not properly put on Christ. When people look at you, they shouldn't see you, they should see Christ. Then you know that you have lived your life as a Christian properly, according to the world. Let it be visible. Put on means to wear. When we wear Christ, we should look like Him. These garments that Christ has given to us should not be an undergarment. They should be an outermost layer that covers us. What do I mean? For some context, let's turn to Matthew. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 to 15. <clears throat> this garment of charity should be something visible, open and easy to see when people look at. Matthew 5, 14 to 15 is something that we all know and we've all read before, but this is the application of it. Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it given light unto all that are in the house. The garments of our salvation and sainthood and God's love should be the first thing that others see when they look at us. And when anybody looks at the Christian, God should be glorified. They should see Christ. They should see Christ. We shouldn't be a Christian and then cover it up with the outer garments of the flesh and the outer garments of the world. And when people see this guy, like, oh, smoke, drink, eat. Hey, uh, Sunday, we going out, oh, I'm going, oh, sorry, I'm going to church. Huh? Oh, I'm smoking, drinking. <laughs> the first thing they see you is, you know, as not a Christian, it's something else. Or maybe you are you have a colleague at work, and this colleague who are every day playing politics, uh, rubbing up to the boss, posing up to the boss, you know, backstabbing other people and all those kind of things. And then say, hey, Sunday, we having a, a get together, the colleagues, you want to come? Oh, sorry, I'm in church. Huh? So it makes sense. That's what happens uh, when we don't put on the robes of charity properly. Okay? We don't conform to the spirit and to the fruits of the Spirit. We don't show the fruits of the Spirit in our lives. This is what happens when we don't mortify the old man and we live like our old selves. When people look at you and they still see you for who you are, then we have not put on Christ properly. We should not cover it up with sin, with the ways of the flesh and of the world. So, three points this morning. Point number one is set your affections. First and foremost, you need to set your affections in your own life, in your own mind. You need to make it uh, intentional. I want to look to the things of God. I want to busy myself about the things of God, growing in Him, building this relationship with Him. It's a, it's a personal thing. It's a personal thing, right? It's not about anything else. It's about a personal relationship with God. And then I need to put off the old man because I know that the Lord loves me. He gave Himself for me. He's given everything for me. Can I not give Him something by... Can I just deny myself certain things? I can, right? I'm not, I'm not, it's not asking me to commit suicide or to take my own life. It's not that difficult. I have to stop certain things that I'm doing that will not please him. This life will belong to me anyway. I'm just a steward. So if he could love me so much and he gave himself for me, I, I'm surely, I surely can give up certain things in my life that shouldn't be there in the first place and not be good for me in the first place. And then I need to put on the charity of Christ. I need to put on Christ, be like Christ. And then conform to him. Love other people as I have been loved. How can I say that I receive such, if like I say again, you are that sinful woman who understands so much how much Christ has forgiven her. Do you think when a friend comes up to her and oh sorry, I, I broke your vase at home, she will get angry for the you better pay me back everything. She will forever be changed already in her mind. She will never look at herself the same way. As far as she's concerned, she's the chiefest of sinners. 
same realization and same conclusion that the Apostle Paul himself came to. He is the chiefest of sinners. And it's the same realization that we each must come to ourselves, that I am the chiefest of sinners and you are the chiefest of sinners. We must see ourselves in that light first as a, as a beginning. And then the blood of Christ becomes precious. And then we start to live for God because of all that He has done for us. And then we start to value ourselves from when we first actually hate ourselves, we start to value ourselves because not because of who we are, but because of what Christ has done for us. And we, our lives, that the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Literally, this will be the words of your life. Like Paul himself says, because he understood he was like that woman. Same, same. You and I are the same. We are not different from this people. We put on Christ because the love of Christ constrains me. How can I not? How can I not? After all that he's done for me, he wants me to go this way, Bola. You want to go there, Bola. Anywhere you want to go, I go. Because you have done so much more for me. And you must you must come to the realization yourself. Without which, no pastor, no brother in Christ, no church member can say, hey, come my friend, hey, come on, hey. Stretching Bola, Bola, hey. Read your Bible, hey, pray, hey. No need. You will do it yourself. You know why? Because the love of God constrains you. Because you realize what He has done for you. Now you cannot not do this for Him. The pastor is not going to do that for you. I'm not going to be able to replicate that experience for you in your life. You will have experienced God in your life for yourself. But the point is, are you looking for Him? Are you setting your affection on things of God? The Bible, the, the Lord says, You will seek me and you will find me if you search for me with all your heart. The problem with many Christians today is that they are not searching for God with all their hearts. Number one, they are not searching for Him at all. They are happy to be where they are, comfortable. I'm going to heaven, that's it, to stop. And that's not the way we ought to live. So, point number one, in application, set your affection. Be addicted to the Lord. Be addicted to the Lord. Be someone, you know the world will tell you uh, that you are good enough for the Lord. You don't need someone to be complete. Let me tell you, friends, you need the law to be complete. You need to be able to not live, to not be able to live your life without the law. The world will tell you, hey, you must be able to live without. You, you cannot say, hey, I cannot live without you. That's not the way you should live your life. You must never depend only on somebody. Yeah, I agree. Not any one person or human being, but the law. You must be able to say that without the law, I cannot survive. I cannot live. I cannot do it. You must come to that place in your life. Be addicted to the law. And serving him. First Corinthians 16, 14 to 16. Let all your things be done with charity. I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Archaea, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. The, 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 the saints, the first fruits of Archaea, the house of Stephanus, addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Same like Lydia, the seller of purple, she addicted herself to ministry to Paul. Constrain them to stay with me. I want to take care of you. Let me see to your needs. 16. That ye might submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. We need to addict ourselves to the ministry, to serving God, to loving God. Let us be like the saints who have set their affections on Christ, who by doing so addicted themselves to the service. Point number one, set your affection. Point number two, put off the old man. Each and every one of us was born into spiritual death, as we have, as we have covered. At salvation, we were given new life in Christ, as we have read in Colossians 3, verse 1 15. In verse 3, it says, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Your life is not your own, your life is Christ. It is hid with Christ in God. When we chose to accept Christ as our Savior, our God, our, our Lord, we made a conscious decision to repent which means to change your mind and turn away from sin and back towards God through faith in Jesus Christ. Once dead in sin, God gave us new life and the regeneration. His life imparted unto us. Therefore, our lives are hid with Christ and God. We are not our own. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Romans 6, 11. Likewise, Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we are alive unto God through Christ, then we must be dead to sin. We 
must be dead to sin. Why then do we carry the dead man around? Do you see people lugging a dead body around? It's a bit nauseating, right? Something is you wouldn't think to do. Then why do we carry the dead man now? That is our old selves now. We should let them go. Let it go. Let the old man go. Romans 6 2. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We are told to put off the old man that is corrupt, that is dead, that is dead. Ephesians 4 22. That he put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Do you not see that the old man is dragging you down, is hindering you from running the race that we ought to run? And putting on the charity of Christ and loving other people? It is your old man that is causing you to get angry and overly angry and acting out on your anger that is uh, causing you to have problems with your relationship, that is causing you to have problems with you know, the way you live your life, with your own health, your own mindset, everything that we do wrongly in this world is because of the old man. Do you not see that it's a way that you need to cut off? The Lord has freed you from your chains. Why are you still lugging the old man around with you? Of course, it's not easy because we are comfortable with our old man. It is like a cho-cho, you know, the poster. No matter how much saliva and bacteria and all that is there, you cannot let go of it because you don't have this, I, I don't have I feel insecure. You know why you feel insecure? Because you're not secure in Christ. That's why you need to hold on to the whole thing to be insecure, to feel secure, to have some comfort. The world, the flesh, the pride of life. But we need to let it go. And we need to take that leap of faith and trust in God. Put off the old man and live unto God. Point number two, put off the dead man. Point number three in application. And last point, put on Christ. At salvation, we will make the righteousness of God in Christ. We cannot take it off. Right? 2 Corinthians 5 21. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. But we are told to put on the charity of God. We are told to put on the charity of God. We are already made the righteousness of God in Christ. We already are the righteousness of God in Christ. As my Lord used to say. But we must put on the charity of Christ. We must conform and be more like Christ. We are at best, today, brethren, we are at best incomplete images of Christ. Incomplete images of Christ. Being shaped and molded, conformed to his image as we grow in Christ each day while we walk this earth in this fleshly body. We are incomplete images of Christ. We need to polish. You know, when you look at a, you know there's a mirror, right? You can see yourself right there. If you use like a metal ladle or a spoon and you try to do it yourself, you don't really see yourself properly. You are like, you must really polish it. Clear out all the dirt, the sin, the worldliness, the flesh, and then you will see yourself, and then God will see His Son in you. He wants to see the reflection of His Son in you. But to do that, we must yield to the work of God in us. We must not resist Him in our lives. He is the purifying, He is the, the Spirit of God and the Word of God that purif purifies us. Like water purifies us, the body. God's Word and the Spirit purifies our soul, purifies our being, right? And we must not resist His work in our lives. And grow in Him to the fullness of the stature of Christ and God in us. So, just a reminder, recap of the three things. Set your affection on things above, put off the dead man, don't carry the dead man around. It stinks, it's smelly, and it's not good for you. And put on Christ. Put on these new robes that God has given to us. And be the vessels of love to other people. Putting on charity, right? Pressing towards the mark in charity. Charity is service in the present. Charity is service in the present. In a more excellent way. More excellent than incomplete signs and miracles. More, more excellent than. The, the, the faith that we have because that's a personal thing, the hope that we have for the future because that's a future tense thing, the present, what's important is in the now. What we have been given in the now, we have to use as stewards to serve the Lord by serving your brethren, loving your brethren, loving lost souls and bringing them in so that they too will come to know the love of Christ. Right? So let's bow into the prisoners.
Have you set your affections on things above? Many of us are Christians. There are many Christians in the world today who have set their affection on things of the world. They have set up shop in the world. Their focus, their affection is on their relationship. Their affection is on who can I, you know, I need a girlfriend or I want to get married or uh, I'm growing, I'm 30 plus already, I'm still not married, I need to find a girlfriend or boyfriend or I go on to the dating apps. There are many people like that today. Christians even. Oh, I go to church because I need to meet new people. That's their affection today. My affection is on the career, really. My career, well, I just started work I need to focus on these things. Well, my boss wants me to go overseas long term, I better go. My boss wants me to work on Sunday, I better work on Sunday. What are, what are your affections on? What is your affection on? You? Is it on things above? If it's not on things above and it's on anything else, it doesn't matter whether, whether that anything is good or bad. Whether you want to get a degree, you're focused on your that degree, or building your career, or building your human relationship, these are all generally good stuff in the us. Good, good ambitions to have, right? But if your affection is not on things above, all these good things in the world will, will come for nothing. Will come for nothing because God is not in them. Set your things, set your affections on things above. And link yourselves to the relationship you have with Christ. Let him be someone that you cannot live without. Put off the old man. Christ has died and paid for your sins. He has, Christ has died so that you can be free of your old man. So that you can be free of the power of the old man and the death and stench of the old man. Why are we still carrying the old man around? Why are we still living in the old man's ways, with the old man's garments, with the old man's sins? Why are we still allowing ourselves to go back and be pierced through with many sorrows because of the old man? When Christ has died to free us from that, put off the old man. You have the power of God in you, just like David, Solomon, Samson, Gideon, Barak, Abraham. Moses, all those that were mentioned in the Bible, you have that same power indwelling in you today to put off the old man. You can put off the old man. Will you not put off the old man? And then put on Christ. When you have become an empty vessel, free of all the former lusts and the old man, and now you are a vessel made for Christ. He has cleansed your life. Bit by bit, this is my experience. I've learned to give up certain things bit by bit. That's not going to happen overnight. Time, one addiction at a time, one addiction at a time, but it will happen if you allow yourself to be constrained by the love of God, to go in the direction He wants you to go. If you have the courage to read your Bible every day, to live by faith and not by sight, you will be able to give up your addictions, you will be able to come out of your depressions, you will be able to find perspective in life and purpose in life and direction in life, but you must choose. To allow yourself to go along with what God wants for you, not kick against the bricks. That's when we complicate things, that's why we make things difficult for ourselves. And then when we become empty vessels, clean and you know, gotten ourselves right with God, it's an ongoing work, by the way, ongoing work, but it should be more and more. Then we become vessels made for the master's use. We put on Christ, we put on the charity that He has given to us, and we live by the Spirit. The life that we now live, I live by the faith of the, in the Son of God who died and gave himself for me. My life that I now live is not my own thing. I live for the Lord. How can I know? How can I know? How can you know? All the things, the works that you know, the pastor preach about every day, prayer meeting, like, this, that, like, all these will come naturally. That's not the point. That's not the goal. That's not the objective. The objective is not the uh, charismata. The objective is to be met cross relationship with God. We are not doing all those things because our relationship with God is broken. You get your relationship with God right, everything else will fall. Amen. So let us pray. Give yourself a minute or two. Talk to God. Realign yourself with God. Ask Him to help you to cover up the gaps in our lives. And help Him. Ask Him to give you the strength and grace to do what He wants you to do. So that you may have peace and joy and 
Help us in your life. That you may press towards the mark of Christ in charity. us to you and drawing us to you and uh, through the gospel that was shared with us, through others who have come to minister Lord in our lives. We thank you for those people who have come and gone. We thank you for you who has abided in us and even at salvation Lord you have changed us and given us a new nature. Thank you for loving us despite us being so unlovable. Lord we thank you for your grace and your mercies. Thank you for again the good work that you have started to have faith, Lord, that you are continuing to work in us even today, standing on the right hand of the Father bodily as our advocate. Uh, and you will continue this good work that you fit and you will finish it, Lord, one day at our glorification where we will be free, Lord, from this body of sin and death. O oh, wretched people that we are, Lord, and we know and trust that you will free us from this body of death. We pray that while we live and breathe, Lord, in this world, that we would not use our members uh, in a selfish way according to our own desires, not give it to the last of the flesh, the last of the eyes, the pride of life, Lord, to do things that are displeasing unto you, but to live our lives in a yielded manner, Lord, to the Spirit, that our lives will bear the fruits of the Spirit and uh, through our witness, others may come to know of you and that you will be glorified. Lord, help us to press towards the mark of uh, the fullness of the stature of Christ. In charity, Lord, through the charity that you've given to us and even through our journey, Lord, may we also just bring others along with us um, as vessels meet for your use. We commit this into your hands and ask the praise in Jesus' name. Alright, thank you. <coughs>